Hey there, and welcome to another hot off the press video from Bioware Babbling. And just like we did with Blue Wraith when it came out, we are going to be covering the newest Dragon Age comic, Dark Fortress Number 1, right as it's coming out. So, if you want to come with me on this journey as we cover the newest and greatest from Bioware and Dark Horse Comics, or just want to find out more about your favorite Bioware books and comics, please feel free to subscribe to the channel and don't be afraid to like the video if you enjoyed it, or, you know, comment your thoughts and opinions below. After that awkward as hell promo to myself is, you know, out of the way, we probably should provide some context and a recap for those who aren't completely sure what has happened before. So, this comic arc officially starts with Dragon Age Deception, though in my opinion the story starts all the way back from the events of Mage Killer, but ugh, who cares about my opinion. Anywho, we start the story with Dragon Age Deception, where the group of Tessa, Marius, Veya, and Sir Aaron are in Ventus looking for the Red Lyrium weapon, and pick up a con artist named Calix and a mage named Francesca in Vindus along the way. Well, Ventus falls to the Canari invasion, but not till they find that the weapon has been moved to Castilium Tenimbris. The party then, for the events of Blue Wraith, head to the mainland to Venter to find the caravan is carrying a special sarcophagus and a very edgy elf named Fenris from Dragon Age 2. Well, he joins the party begrudgingly out of self-interest and for love of Autumn the Mumbari, after catching up to the caravan and in a dope fight scene, kills Francesca's father who was helping the Venatori willingly. Now the party, without Calix, because he decided to leave the group in Blue Wraith number 3, go out to try to find the Red Lyrium weapon at Castilium Tenimbris. Okay, so that didn't do any of the stories really any justice and it skipped over a lot. But now that's really all out of the way, that should get us up to speed enough to dive into this issue of Dragon Age, the Dark Fortress number one. We start at the Battle of Ostagar, with Loghain telling his men to fall back and Sir Aaron being among them. This is, to my knowledge, the first time we actually get to see the Battle of Ostagar from anywhere closely resembling Loghain's perspective. Hearing the order, Sir Aaron willingly ignores it and charges into the battle, being a fool for doing so. Sir Aaron cuts down Dark Spawn and calls out for his king before he awakens to his nightmare in present day to Venter. He wakes up calling for Caelan's name, and Vea is there to ask if he wants to talk about his dreams of Ostagar. He says that he just they need to rest for tomorrow, and he's just really tired. Vea and Autumn happily take watch for him for that night. Cutting to the rest of the party, Fenor shows concern, wanting to know if there is anything that they can do to help him. Tessa tells him that not to worry, and Vea has him covered. After all, he is practically a father to her. This upsets Francesca, and she storms off, and Tessa goes to talk to her. While Francesca is crying, Tessa apologizes for upsetting her, but Francesca replies that she did nothing wrong by saying the word father, and that she should be stronger than that. Tessa responds that no one could be stronger than standing up to their father and doing what they believed is right. Back with Fenris, he merely states that this group has a lot of issues to get no response from Marius. We switch scenes to our villains of our story, arriving to Castilium Tenimbris with the mage named Denarius welcoming them to the Castilium and inquiring where is Magister Invindus. Magister Neil Nelius states that he is no longer needed as he already knows how to use the Red Lyrium weapon and the sarcophagus in roasting the young man for his intellect. Professor Marquette informs him of the details and, in turn, Denarius asks if this will suffice for the ritual needed, which our villains grin at whatever the audience cannot see off screen. Cutting back to the protagonist, we get Fenris giving a little bit of a history lesson for the city of... Oh god, okay, this is gonna be a bit of a mouthful. Neuromenian? Yeah, sure, that one. And asks, why did they come here of all places? 
Fenris states that his old manster built a secret tunnel to the town in the event that his fortress was ever taken. But due to his rebellion, the old tunnel was destroyed and a new one must have been built in its place. Tessa chooses to scout around and see if she can find anyone that works in the fortress, while the rest of the party decides to go to the tavern and wait for her there. Back at the Bad Boys Club, Nanalius and Marquette discuss that Magister Quintara has actually been dead for some time, and that this imposter was easy enough to manipulate to get what they want, and further discuss their plan of fusing Red Lyrium into Shiralas and arming him with the Red Lyrium weapon, and that with that his power growing stronger and stronger, they will be able to push back the Kunari and reconquer once was all of the Tevinter Imperium. And finally, Denarius budges in with all this talk about their plan. Nilnalius lays down the fucking law, stating that he is an idiot. So much so that he asks, what is the purpose of him being a part of this anymore? While Denarius is able to state that he has the sarcophagus, he has the Castilium, and the magic to control both the castle and the mages here, Nilnalius easily thwarts these arguments, as these were all given to him because Nilnalius convinced the Venatori to recognize him as the true heir of the House of Denarius, instead of just being the bastard that he is. And Nilnalius has a parepete. So does he really think that he can win against that? Nilnalius asks again, What does Denarius bring to the table? Back with the party again, Sir Aaron is eyeing down his drink, while Francesca thinks Vea should talk to him. But Vea states that she can't put too much pressure on him, and that this needs to be his choice. But Vea does ask how she's doing, and Francesca is unsure, and wonders if Vea has ever killed anyone close to her before. Vea states that she's never even killed anybody, and asks if Marius if killing ever does get easier, and he does state yes it does. Fenris chimes in though that making it easier can even make it worse, but what Sir Aaron is going through? It's a little bit more than that. It's just like what happened to Hawk when they lost their mother. Being haunted by failure. But Tessa arrives with good news. She found Denarius! Now with rage in his eyes, Fenris states that Denarius and all of his heirs died by his hands. Terrified of Fenris now, Tessa states that this new Denarius is actually a bastard that was just recently recognized and moved into the Castilium recently. Currently, he is in a wealthy end of town getting hammered, while Fenris looks like he's about to go on the warpath to end the Denarius line a second time. Vea stops him, stating that this is the most likely person to know about a secret passageway into the Castilium, and Sir Aaron, standing tall and proud, backs her up on this. It's time to actually spring their plan into action, which is made even easier with Denarius being completely hammered. After being told that he has had way too much to drink, Denarius tells his two guards, who are actually Sir Aaron and Marius, disguised as his guards, to kill Nilnalius and his Parepite if they ever come looking for him. Denarius makes his way to his room, where he is immediately ambushed by first Vea taking his staff, followed up by Fenris and Autumn jumping out of the closet. While he is unable to call his staff due to Vea holding onto it, he says he will be able to use his hands for this. But Fenris not only blocks his magic attacks with ease, but is so unfazed by these weak attacks, he merely walks through them and headbutts the mage. Fenris then pins Denarius to the ground and is an inch away from killing him, but Ferreira stays his hand. While this part of their plan is going well, another complication makes itself known. The Kunari have arrived. Tessa yells at them they need answers now, and Fenris gets to work immediately. He states that with him being able to rip out Denarius's humorous to get him to start talking, but Denarius doesn't control the Castilium and everything was taken away by Nilnalius. But does Fenris care about his squalors? No, not really. 
And after apologizing to Autumn for using an analogy, Fenris gets straight to the point. Where is the secret exit out of the Castilium, and where does it lead so they can enter it? His torture techniques do land him some answers, but they're not the ones he was hoping for. It turns out the entrance to the secret exit can only be opened from the inside, and they sure as hell aren't going to be able to survive crossing that bridge. Francesca sees the Kunari horse riders coming, and if earlier wasn't the time to leave, it really is now high time to leave it. She warns the others that the Kunari are here, and Denarius demands to be let go. After all, they don't have time to kill him. What he doesn't realize is that Fenris is more than willing to make up time to kill him, but a twisted turn of fate, he stays his hand before the rest of the party leave the wounded mage tied to a chair. Meanwhile, the Kunari are invading the rest of the town and slaughtering everyone they see. But a boy is saved by the Kunari commander who believes that he could be re-educated. The commander is then informed that they found a mage tied up and informed them that there is a secret dark castle that is about to perform a secret forbidden ritual tonight, and that that ritual could turn the tide of the war in Devinter's favor. Knowing that the type of threat this could pose, the commander vows to take this secret castle and to make sure that this ritual does not occur. And that is our first issue of The Dark Fortress. It is an incredibly strong start to a series that I really do think needed a strong start. While I do think the artwork stole the show, I'm going to start off with the writing first. What really makes this issue good is it finally feels like we are having a cohesive team working together and finally moving towards the Red Lyrium weapon and the sarcophagus, which I've complained about in the past, that they really didn't do in any of the previous series. Granted, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more progression moving forward, but that hopefully will be made up for in the fact that, well, the Kunari are now joining the fray. While I was a little shocked that again the Kunari show up at the party's doorstep, again, I do feel like this is going to set up the fact that they are a much larger player in the events to come. One thing that is approved upon from Blue Wraith is the fact that the Kunari are actually depicted far better than in the last series. I complained in Blue Wraith that the Kunari f weren't really depicted as well because they were shown to be more mindless than Darkspawn and just cannon fodder. Instead of being the true, intelligent adversary the Kunari can actually be. The Kunari are absolutely brutal and merciless, don't get me wrong but we actually see the Kunari as the intelligent adversaries they actually can be, and adapt their tactics to a new threat, stopping the Dark Ritual. At the same time, somehow the Kunari put an additional time pressure on the protagonists to actually get the mission done. So, they are almost used as a force of nature crashing into the plot. This makes me wonder where the hell the rest of the Tevinter military is, since we only see mentions of them in Tevinter Knights, and that story mainly involved them getting murked by an elderly crow. Regardless, I'm hoping the next issue ramps up the pace, and we actually get to see some real plot moving along, and hopefully some dope fight scenes along the way. I will also say that it was very nice that they didn't jump around in perspectives as much in this issue. That was a really big problem with Blue Race, to be honest with y'all. Now, the real wow factor of this comic is the artwork. Now, mind you, Fernando Furukawa is really well known for his bloody and action-packed panels, which, don't get me wrong, we definitely get to see that. But what takes the cake was the artistic depictions of the characters. The characters we see of all the characters emoting, communicating, and reacting to all these situations is done with such amazing detail, and as close as you can get to photorealistic with this type of art style, you can really tell that the artists put in so much work and passion into these panels. Not to say that they didn't do that in their other bits of work, but to be honest, this is magnum opus levels of work. To 
Fernando Furukawa, Sebastian Hines, Rico Zucci, Michael Atiyah, and Sachin Tang. This is truly magnificent work. And from the bottom of my heart, I applaud you for making this amazing artwork for us and giving it to the Dragon Age community. So, thank you. Now, I'm going to call it here. If you guys want to follow my journey of covering the Dark Fortress comics, please subscribe to the channel and for God's sake, like the video at least to show the drawing team that you loved their artwork as much as I did. Now with that, I bid you adieu, and I will see you for Dark Fortress number two. Or, I'll see you guys next time, you nerds!